Chapter Forty Four of the Pickwick Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Lynn. The Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. Chapter Forty Four treats of divers little matters which occurred in the fleet, and of Mr. Winkle's mysterious behaviour, and shows how the poor chancery prisoner obtained his release at last. Mr. Pickwick felt a great deal too much touched by the warmth of Sam's attachment to be able to exhibit any manifestation of anger or displeasure at the precipitate course he had adopted in voluntarily consigning himself to a debtor's prison for an indefinite period. The only point on which he persevered in demanding an explanation was the name of Sam's detaining creditor, but this Mr. Weller as perseveringly withheld. "'It ain't a no use, sir.' said Sam, again and again. He's a malicious, bad-disposed, worldly-minded, spiteful, vindictive creature, with a hard heart as there ain't no softening, as the virtuous clergyman remarked of the old gentleman with the dropsy, when he said that upon the whole he thought he'd rather leave his property to his wife than build a chapel with it. "'But consider, Sam,' Mr. Pickwick remonstrated, "'the sum is so small that it can very easily be paid, "'and having made up my mind that you shall stop with me, "'you should recollect how much more useful you would be "'if you could go outside the walls.' "'Very much obliged to you, sir,' replied Mr. Weller gravely, "'but I'd rather not.' "'Rather not do what, Sam?' "'Why, I'd rather not let myself down to ask a favour of this here unremorseful enemy.' "'But it is no favour asking him to take his money, Sam,' reasoned Mr. Pickwick. "'Beg your pardon, sir,' rejoined Sam, "'but it'd be a wery great favour to pay it, and he don't deserve none. "'That's where it is, sir.' Here Mr. Pickwick, rubbing his nose with an air of some vexation, Mr. Weller thought it prudent to change the theme of the discourse. "'I takes my determination on principle, sir,' remarked Sam, "'and you takes yours on the same ground, "'vich puts me in mind of the man as killed hisself on principle, "'which, of course, you've heard on, sir.' "'Mr. Weller paused when he arrived at this point, "'and cast a comical look at his master out of the corners of his eyes. "'There is no of course in the case, Sam,' said Mr. Pickwick, "'gradually breaking into a smile, "'in spite of the uneasiness which Sam's obstinacy had given him. "'The fame of the gentleman in question never reached my ears.' "'No, sir?' exclaimed Mr. Weller. "'You astonish me, sir. "'He was a clerk in a government office, sir.' "'Was he?' said Mr. Pickwick. "'Yes, he was, sir,' rejoined Mr. Weller. "'and a very pleasant gentleman, too, "'one of the precise and tidy sort, "'as puts their feet in little India-rubber fire-buckets "'when it's wet weather, "'and never has no other bosom friends but hare-skins. "'He saved up his money on principle, "'wore a clean shirt every day on principle, "'never spoke to none of his relations on principle, "'fear they should want to borrow money of him, "'and was altogether, in fact, "'an uncommon agreeable character.' He had his hair cut on principle once a fortnight, and contracted for his clothes on the economic principle three suits a year, and send back the old uns. Being a wary regular gentleman, he dined every day at the same place, where it was one and nine to cut off the joint, and a wary good one and nine's worth he used to cut, as the landlord often said, with the tears a trickling down his face, let alone the way he used to poke the fire in the winter time which was a dead loss of four pence halfpenny a day, to say nothing at all of the aggravation of seeing him do it. So uncommon grand with it, too. Post out of the next gentleman, he sings out every day when he comes in. See out of the times, Thomas. Let me look at the morning herald when it's out of hand. Don't forget to bespeak the chronicle. And just bring the tizer, will you? And then he'd set, with his eyes fixed on the clock, and rush out, "'just a quarter of a minute for the time to waylay the boy "'as was a coming in with the evening paper, "'which he'd read with such intense interest and perseverance "'as worked the other customers up "'to the weary confines of desperation and insanity, "'specially one irascible old gentleman, "'as the Vader was always obliged to keep a sharp eye on at such times, "'fear he should be tempted to commit some rash act with the carving-knife. "'Bell, sir,' 
Here he'd stop, occupying the best place for three hours, and never taking nothing arter his dinner but sleep, and then he'd go away to a coffee house a few streets off, and have a small pot of coffee and four crumpets, arter which he'd walk home to Kensington and go to bed. One night he was took very ill, sends for a doctor. Doctor comes in a green fly, with a kind of Robinson Crusoe set of steps, as he could let down when he got out, and pull up arter him when he got in, to prevent the necessity of the coachman's getting down, and thereby undeceiving the public by letting him see that it was only a livery coat as he'd got on, and not the trousers to match. "'What's the matter?' says the doctor. "'Wery ill,' says the patient. "'What have you been a-eatin' on?' says the doctor. "'Roast wheel,' says the patient. "'What's the last thing you devoured?' says the doctor. "'Crumpets,' says the patient. "'That's it,' says the doctor. "'I'll send you a box of pills directly, "'and don't you never take no more of them,' he says. "'No more of what?' says the patient. "'Pills?' "'No, crumpets,' says the doctor. "'Why?' says the patient, starting up in bed. "'I've eat four crumpets every night for fifteen year on principle.' "'Well, then, you'd better leave em off on principle,' says the doctor. "'Crumpets is not wholesome, sir,' says the doctor, wary fierce. "'But they're so cheap,' says the patient, coming down a little, "'and so wary fillin' at the price. "'They'd be dear to you at any price. "'Dear if you was paid to eat em,' says the doctor. Four crumpets a night,' he says, "'will do your business in six months.' The patient looks him full in the face and turns it over in his mind for a long time, and at last he says, "'Are you sure of that air, sir?' "'I'll stake my professional reputation on it,' says the doctor. "'How many crumpets at a sittin' do you think it'd kill me off at once?' says the patient. "'I don't know,' says the doctor. "'Do you think half a crown's worth it do it?' says the patient. "'I think it might,' says the doctor. Three shillings worth it'd be sure to do it, I suppose.' says the patient. Certainly, says the doctor. Very good, says the patient. Good night. Next morning he gets up, has a fire lit, orders in three shillings worth of crumpets, toasts them all, eats them all, and blows his brains out. What did he do that for? inquired Mr. Pickwick abruptly, for he was considerably startled by this tragical termination of the narrative. What did he do it for, sir? reiterated Sam. "'Why, in support of his great principle that Crumpets was wholesome, "'and to show that he wouldn't be put out of his way for nobody. "'With such like shiftings and changings of the discourse "'did Mr. Weller meet his master's questioning "'on the night of his taking up his residence in the fleet. "'Finding all gentle remonstrance useless, "'Mr. Pickwick at length yielded a reluctant consent "'to his taking lodgings by the week of a bald-headed cobbler "'who rented a small slip-room in one of the upper galleries.' To this humble apartment Mr. Weller moved a mattress and bedding, which he hired of Mr. Roker, and by the time he lay down upon it at night was as much at home as if he had been bred in the prison, and his whole family had vegetated therein for three generations. "'Do you always smoke, or do you goes to bed, old cock?' inquired Mr. Weller of his landlord, when they had both retired for the night. "'Yes, I does, young bantam,' replied the cobbler. "'Will you allow me to inquire why you make up your bed under that air deal table?' said Sam. "'Cause I was always used to a four-poster afore I came here, "'and to find the legs of the table answer just as well,' replied the cobbler. "'You're a character, sir,' said Sam. "'I haven't got anything of the kind belonging to me,' rejoined the cobbler, shaking his head. "'And if you want to meet with a good one, "'I'm afraid you'll find some difficulty in suiting yourself at this register office.' The above short dialogue took place as Mr. Weller lay extended on his mattress at one end of the room, and the cobbler on his at the other, the apartment being illumined by the light of a rush candle, and the cobbler's pipe, which was glowing below the table like a red-hot coal. The conversation, brief as it was, predisposed Mr. Weller strongly in his landlord's favour, and raising himself on his elbow, he took a more lengthened survey of his appearance than he had yet had either time or inclination to make. He was a sallow man, all cobblers are, and had a strong, bristly beard, all cobblers have. His face was a queer, good-tempered, crooked-featured piece of workmanship, ornamented with a couple of eyes that must have worn a very joyous expression at one time, for they sparkled yet. 
The man was sixty by years, and heaven knows how old by imprisonment, so that his having any look approaching to mirth or contentment was singular enough. He was a little man, and being half doubled up as he lay in bed, looked about as long as he ought to have been without his legs. He had a great red pipe in his mouth, and was smoking and staring at the rushlight in a state of enviable placidity. "'Have you been here long?' inquired Sam, breaking the silence which had lasted for some time. Twelve year,' replied the cobbler, biting the end of his pipe as he spoke. "'Contempt?' inquired Sam. The cobbler nodded. "'Well, then,' said Sam with some sternness, "'what do you persevere in being obstinate for, "'vasting your precious life away in this here magnified pound?' "'Why don't you give in and tell the Chancellorship "'that you're very sorry for making his court contemptible "'and you won't do so no more?' "'The cobbler put his pipe in the corner of his mouth "'while he smiled, and then brought it back to its old place again, "'but said nothing. "'Why don't you?' said Sam, urging his question strenuously. "'Ah,' said the cobbler, "'you don't quite understand these matters. "'What do you suppose ruined me now?' "'Why,' said Sam, trimming the rushlight, "'I suppose the beginning was that you got into debt, eh?' "'Never owed a farden,' said the cobbler. "'Try again.' "'Well, perhaps,' said Sam, "'you bought houses, which is delicate English for going mad, "'or took to building, which is a medical term for being incurable.' "'The cobbler shook his head and said, "'Try again.' "'You didn't go to law, I hope,' said Sam suspiciously. "'Never in my life,' replied the cobbler. "'The fact is, I was ruined by having money left me.' "'Come, come,' said Sam, "'that won't do. "'I wish some rich enemy had tried to work my destruction in that air bay. "'I'd let him.' "'Oh, I dare say you don't believe it,' said the cobbler, "'quietly smoking his pipe. "'I wouldn't, if I was you, but it's true for all that.' "'How was it?' inquired Sam, "'half induced to believe the fact already by the look the cobbler gave him.' "'Just this,' replied the cobbler, "'an old gentleman that I worked for down in the country, "'and a humble relation of whose I married, "'she's dead, God bless her, and thank him for it, "'was seized with a fit and went off.' "'Where?' inquired Sam, "'who was growing sleepy after the numerous events of the day. "'How should I know where he went?' said the cobbler, "'speaking through his nose in an intense enjoyment of his pipe. "'He went off dead.' "'Oh, that indeed,' said Sam. "'Well?' Well, said the cobbler, he left five thousand pound behind him. And wary genteel in him so to do, said Sam. One of which, continued the cobbler, he left to me, cause I married his relation, you see. Wary good, murmured Sam. And being surrounded by a great number of nieces and nevies, as was always quarrelling and fighting among themselves for the property, he makes me his executor, and leaves the rest to me in trust to divide it among em as the will provided. "'What do you mean by leaving it on trust?' inquired Sam, waking up a little. "'If it ain't ready money, where's the use on it?' "'It's a law term, that's all,' said the cobbler. "'I don't think that,' said Sam, shaking his head. "'There's wary little trust at that shop. "'Howsever, go on.' "'Well,' said the cobbler, "'when I was going to take out a probate of the will, "'the nieces and nevies, who was desperately disappointed "'at not getting all the money, enters a caveat against it.' "'What's that?' inquired Sam. "'A legal instrument, which is as much as to say it's no go,' replied the cobbler. "'I see,' said Sam, "'a sort of brother-in-law of the Havis carcass. "'Well?' "'But,' continued the cobbler, "'finding that they couldn't agree among themselves, "'and consequently couldn't get up a case against the will, "'they withdrew the caveat, and I paid all the legacies. "'I'd hardly done it, "'when one nevy brings an action to set the will aside. "'The case comes on some months afterwards "'afore a deaf old gentleman in a back room "'somewhere down by Paul's churchyard, "'and arter four councils had taken a day apiece "'to bother him regularly, "'he takes a week or two to consider "'and read the evidence in six volumes, "'and then gives his judgment "'that how the testator was not quite right in his head, "'and I must pay all the money back again "'and all the costs. "'I appealed.' The case come on before three or four very sleepy gentlemen, who had heard it all before in the other court, where their lawyers without work. 
the only difference being that there they're called doctors and in the other place delegates, if you understand that, and they very dutifully confirmed the decision of the old gentleman below. After that we went into Chancery, where we are still, and where I shall always be. My lawyers have had all my thousand pound long ago, and what between the estate, as they call it, and the costs, I'm here for ten thousand, and shall stop here till I die, mending shoes. Some gentlemen have talked of bringing it before Parliament, and I dare say would have done it, only they hadn't time to come to me, and I hadn't power to go to them, and they got tired of my long letters and dropped the business. And this is God's truth without one word of suppression or exaggeration, as fifty people, both in this place and out of it, very well know. The cobbler paused to ascertain what effect his story had produced on Sam, but finding that he had dropped asleep, knocked the ashes out of his pipe, sighed, put it down, drew the bedclothes over his head, and went to sleep too. Mr. Pickwick was sitting at breakfast alone next morning, Sam being busily engaged in the cobbler's room, polishing his master's shoes and brushing the black gaiters, when there came a knock at the door, which before Mr. Pickwick could cry, Come in, was followed by the appearance of a head of hair and a cotton velvet cap, both of which articles of dress he had no difficulty in recognizing as the personal property of Mr. Smangle. "'How are you?' said that worthy, accompanying the inquiry with a score or two of nods. "'I say, do you expect anybody this morning? Three men, devilish gentlemanly fellows, have been asking after you downstairs, and knocking at every door on the hall flight, for which they've been most infernally blown up by the collegians that had the trouble of opening them. "'Dear me, how very foolish of them!' said Mr. Pickwick, rising. "'Yes, I have no doubt they are some friends whom I rather expected to see yesterday.' "'Friends of yours!' exclaimed Smangle, seizing Mr. Pickwick by the hand. "'Say no more. Curse me, they're friends of mine from this minute, and friends of Mivins's too. Infernal pleasant, gentlemanly dog, Mivins, isn't he?' said Smangle, with great feeling. "'I know so little of the gentleman,' said Mr. Pickwick, hesitating, "'that I—' "'I know you do,' interrupted Smangle, clasping Mr. Pickwick by the shoulder. "'You shall know him better. You'll be delighted with him. "'That man, sir,' said Smangle, with a solemn countenance, "'has comic powers that would do honour to Drury Lane Theatre.' "'Has he, indeed?' said Mr. Pickwick. "'Ah, by Jove, he has,' replied Smangle. "'Hear him come the four cats in the wheelbarrow.' Four distinct cats, sir, I pledge you my honour. Now you know that's infernal clever. Dammy, you can't help liking a man when you see these traits about him. He's only one fault, that little failing I mentioned to you, you know. As Mr. Smangle shook his head in a confidential and sympathising manner at this juncture, Mr. Pickwick felt that he was expected to say something. So he said, Ah, and looked restlessly at the door. "'Ah!' echoed Mr. Smangle, with a long-drawn sigh. "'He's delightful company, that man is, sir. "'I don't know better company anywhere, but he has that one drawback. "'If the ghost of his grandfather, sir, was to rise before him this minute, "'he'd ask him for the loan of his acceptance on an eight-penny stamp.' "'Dear me!' exclaimed Mr. Pickwick. "'Yes,' added Mr. Smangle. "'And if he'd the power of raising him again, he would, "'in two months and three days from this time, to renew the bill.' "'Those are very remarkable traits,' said Mr. Pickwick. "'But I'm afraid that while we are talking here "'my friends may be in a state of great perplexity at not finding me.' "'I'll show them the way,' said Smangle, making for the door. "'Good day. I won't disturb you while they're here, you know. "'By the by,' as Smangle pronounced the last three words, "'he stopped suddenly, reclosed the door which he had opened, "'and walking softly back to Mr. Pickwick, "'stepped close up to him on tiptoe, and said in a very soft whisper, "'You couldn't make it convenient to lend me half a crown "'till the latter end of next week, could you?' "'Mr. Pickwick could scarcely forbear smiling, "'but managing to preserve his gravity, "'he drew forth the coin and placed it in Mr. Smangle's palm, "'upon which that gentleman, with many nods and winks, "'implying profound mystery, "'disappeared in quest of the three strangers "'with whom he presently returned.' and having coughed thrice and nodded as many times, as an assurance to Mr. Pickwick that he would not forget to pay, he shook hands all round in an engaging manner, and at length took himself off. "'My dear 
friends,' said Mr. Pickwick, shaking hands alternately with Mr. Tupman, Mr. Winkle, and Mr. Snodgrass, who were the three visitors in question. "'I am delighted to see you.' The triumvirate were much affected. Mr. Tupman shook his head deploringly. Mr. Snodgrass drew forth his handkerchief with undisguised emotion, and Mr. Winkle retired to the window and sniffed aloud. "'Morning, gentlemen,' said Sam, entering at the moment with the shoes and gaiters. "'A vaveth melancholy, as the little boy said, when his school missus died. "'Welcome to the college, gentlemen.' "'This foolish fellow,' said Mr. Pickwick, tapping Sam on the head, "'as he knelt down to button up his master's gaiters, "'this foolish fellow has got himself arrested in order to be near me.' "'What?' exclaimed the three friends. "'Yes, gentlemen,' said Sam. "'I'm a—' "'Stand steady, sir, if you please. "'I'm a prisoner, gentlemen. "'Confined, as the lady said. "'A prisoner?' exclaimed Mr. Winkle, with unaccountable vehemence. "'Hullo, sir,' responded Sam, looking up. "'What's the matter, sir?' "'I had hoped, Sam, that—' "'Nothing, nothing,' said Mr. Winkle precipitately. There was something so very abrupt and unsettled in Mr. Winkle's manner that Mr. Pickwick involuntarily looked at his two friends for an explanation. "'We don't know,' said Mr. Tupman, answering this mute appeal aloud. He has been much excited for two days past, and his whole demeanour very unlike what it usually is. We feared there must be something the matter, but he resolutely denies it. "'No, no,' said Mr. Winkle, colouring beneath Mr. Pickwick's gaze. "'There is really nothing. I assure you there is nothing, my dear sir. It will be necessary for me to leave town for a short time, on private business, and I had hoped to have prevailed upon you to allow Sam to accompany me. Mr. Pickwick looked more astonished than before. "'I think,' faltered Mr. Winkle, "'that Sam would have had no objection to do so, "'but, of course, his being a prisoner here renders it impossible, "'so I must go alone.' "'As Mr. Winkle said these words, "'Mr. Pickwick felt, with some astonishment, "'that Sam's fingers were trembling at the gaiters, "'as if he were rather surprised or startled. "'Sam looked up at Mr. Winkle, too, when he had finished speaking, "'and though the glance they exchanged was instantaneous, "'they seemed to understand each other. "'Do you know anything of this, Sam?' said Mr. Pickwick sharply. "'No, I don't, sir,' replied Mr. Weller, "'beginning to button with extraordinary assiduity. "'Are you sure, Sam?' said Mr. Pickwick. "'Why, sir?' responded Mr. Weller. "'I'm sure so far that I've never heard anything on the subject before this moment. "'If I makes any guess about it,' added Sam, looking at Mr. Winkle, "'I haven't got any right to say what it is. "'Fear it should be a wrong un. "'I have no right to make any further inquiry into the private affairs of a friend, "'however intimate a friend,' said Mr. Pickwick, after a short silence. "'At present let me merely say that I do not understand this at all.' "'There, we have had quite enough of the subject.' Thus expressing himself, Mr. Pickwick led the conversation to different topics, and Mr. Winkle gradually appeared more at ease, though still very far from being completely so. They had all so much to converse about, that the morning very quickly passed away, and when, at three o'clock, Mr. Weller produced upon the little dining-table a roast leg of mutton and an enormous meat-pie, with sundry dishes of vegetables and pots of porter, which stood upon the chairs or the sofa bedstead, or where they could, everybody felt disposed to do justice to the meal, notwithstanding that the meat had been purchased and dressed, and the pie made and baked at the prison cookery hard by. To these succeeded a bottle or two of very good wine, for which a messenger was dispatched by Mr. Pickwick to the Horn Coffee House in Doctors' Commons. The bottle or two, indeed, might be more properly described as a bottle or six, for by the time it was drunk and tea over the bell began to ring for the strangers to withdraw. But if Mr. Winkle's behaviour had been unaccountable in the morning, it became perfectly unearthly and solemn when, under the influence of his feelings and his share of the bottle or six, he prepared to take leave of his friend. He lingered behind until Mr. Tupman and Mr. Snodgrass had disappeared, 
and then fervently clenched Mr. Pickwick's hand, with an expression of face in which deep and mighty resolve was fearfully blended with the very concentrated essence of gloom. "'Good night, my dear sir,' said Mr. Winkle between his set teeth. "'Bless you, my dear fellow,' replied the warm-hearted Mr. Pickwick, as he returned to the pressure of his young friend's hand. "'Now, then,' cried Mr. Tupman from the gallery. "'Yes, yes, directly,' replied Mr. Winkle. "'Good night. Good night,' said Mr. Pickwick. There was another good night, and another, and half a dozen more after that, and still Mr. Winkle had fast hold of his friend's hand, and was looking into his face with the same strange expression. "'Is anything the matter?' said Mr. Pickwick at last, when his arm was quite sore with shaking. "'Nothing.' said Mr. Winkle. "'Well, then, good night,' said Mr. Pickwick, attempting to disengage his hand. "'My friend, my benefactor, my honoured companion,' murmured Mr. Winkle, catching at his wrist, "'do not judge me harshly. Do not, when you hear that, driven to extremity by hopeless obstacles, I—' "'Now, then,' said Mr. Tupman, reappearing at the door, "'are you coming, or are we to be locked in?' "'Yes,' "'Yes, I am ready,' replied Mr. Winkle, and with a violent effort he tore himself away. As Mr. Pickwick was gazing down the passage after them in silent astonishment, Sam Weller appeared at the stairhead and whispered for one moment in Mr. Winkle's ear. "'Oh, certainly, depend upon me,' said that gentleman aloud. "'Thank you, sir. You won't forget, sir?' said Sam. "'Of course not,' replied Mr. Winkle." "'Wish you luck, sir,' said Sam, touching his hat. "'I should very much like to have joined you, sir, "'but the governor, of course, is paramount. "'It is very much to your credit that you remain here,' said Mr. Winkle. "'With these words they disappeared down the stairs. "'Very extraordinary,' said Mr. Pickwick, "'going back into his room and seating himself at the table "'in a musing attitude. "'What can that young man be going to do?' He had sat ruminating about the matter for some time, when the voice of Broker the turnkey demanded whether he might come in. "'By all means,' said Mr. Pickwick. "'I've brought you a softer pillow, sir,' said Mr. Roker, "'instead of the temporary one you had last night.' "'Thank you,' said Mr. Pickwick. "'Will you take a glass of wine?' "'You're wery good, sir,' replied Mr. Roker, accepting the proffered glass. "'Yours, sir.' "'Thank you,' said Mr. Pickwick.' "'I'm sorry to say that your landlord's very bad to-night, sir,' said Roker, setting down the glass, and inspecting the lining of his hat preparatory to putting it on again. "'What? The Chancery prisoner?' exclaimed Mr. Pickwick. "'He won't be a Chancery prisoner very long, sir,' replied Roker, turning his hat round, so as to get the maker's name right side upwards as he looked into it. "'You make my blood run cold,' said Mr. Pickwick. "'What do you mean?' "'He's been consumptive for a long time past,' said Mr. Roker, "'and he's taken wery bad in the breath to-night. "'The doctor said six months ago that nothing but change of air could save him.' "'Great heaven!' exclaimed Mr. Pickwick. "'Has this man been slowly murdered by the law for six months?' "'I don't know about that,' replied Roker, "'weighing the hat by the brim in both hands. "'I suppose he'd have been took the same wherever he was.' He went into the infirmary this morning. The doctor says his strength is to be kept up as much as possible, and the warden sent him wine and broth and that from his own house. It's not the warden's fault, you know, sir. Of course not, replied Mr. Pickwick hastily. I'm afraid, however, said Roker, shaking his head, that it's all up with him. I offered Nettie two sixpenneths to one upon it just now, but he wouldn't take it, and quite right. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. "'Stay,' said Mr. Pickwick earnestly. "'Where is this infirmary?' "'Just over where you slept, sir,' replied Roker. "'I'll show you if you like to come.' Mr. Pickwick snatched up his hat without speaking and followed at once. The turnkey led the way in silence, and gently raising the latch of the room door, motioned Mr. Pickwick to enter. It was a large, bare, desolate room, with a number of stump bedsteads made of iron, on one of which lay stretched the shadow of a man, wan, pale, and ghastly. His breathing was hard and thick, and he moaned painfully as it came and went. At the bedside sat a short old man in a cobbler's apron, 
who, by the aid of a pair of horn spectacles, was reading from the Bible aloud. It was the fortunate legatee. The sick man laid his hand upon his attendant's arm and motioned him to stop. He closed the book and laid it on the bed. "'Open the window,' said the sick man. He did so. The noise of carriages and carts, the rattle of wheels, the cries of men and boys, all the busy sounds of a mighty multitude, instinct with life and occupation, blended into one deep murmur, floated into the room. Above the hoarse loud hum arose from time to time a boisterous laugh, or a scrap of some jingling song shouted forth by one of the giddy crowd would strike upon the ear for an instant, and then be lost amidst the roar of voices and the tramp of footsteps. The breaking of the billows of the restless sea of life that rolled heavily on without. These are melancholy sounds to a quiet listener at any time, but how melancholy to the watcher by the bed of death. "'There is no air here,' said the man faintly. "'The place pollutes it. "'It was fresh round about when I walked there years ago, "'but it grows hot and heavy in passing these walls. "'I cannot breathe it.' "'We have breathed it together for a long time,' said the old man. "'Come, come.' "'There was a short silence during which the two spectators approached the bed. "'The sick man drew a hand of his old fellow-prisoner towards him, and pressing it affectionately between both his own, retained it in his grasp. "'I hope,' he gasped after a while, so faintly that they bent their ears close over the bed to catch the half-formed sounds his pale lips gave vent to, "'I hope my merciful judge will bear in mind my heavy punishment on earth. Twenty years, my friend, twenty years in this hideous grave. My heart broke when my child died, and I could not even kiss him in his little coffin.' My loneliness since then, and all this noise and riot, has been very dreadful. May God forgive me. He has seen my solitary, lingering death. He folded his hands, and murmuring something more they could not hear, fell into a sleep. Only a sleep at first, for they saw him smile. They whispered together for a little time, and the turnkey, stooping over the pillow, drew hastily back. "'He has got his discharge by G said the man. He had. But he had grown so like death in life that they knew not when he died. End of chapter 44